morning. Good morning. That's pretty good. Not bad. I'll let, I'll let it go with that this morning. All right. Well, this morning, uh, uh, y'all gonna have to have to use your books a little bit. So uh, you have to have to dig out them old hymnals and uh, and pull the dust off of them. Uh, we're gonna start out singing, uh, "Lord, we praise you." That's on page one thirty-five. But first, stand with me as we open up in a word of prayer this morning. Father, we come today and we just thank you for this time uh, that you've given us this opportunity to come to your house and to worship together. We're just going to ask you this morning, Father, to uh, put your hand on this service. Father, bless each and every one that's made it out this morning. Father, just help us to uh, open ourselves up to hear you speak to each and every one of us. Help us to uh, hear your word today, Father, and just help us to uh, not just hear it, but to respond to it today, Father. And just uh, ask you to bless and be with those that may be sick today, Father, and just uh, give them a physical touch today and just uh, be with those that just uh, aren't feeling well, just whatever reason, Father. We're just going to ask that um, that if they need a convicting spirit, Father, that you convict our hearts today, Father, and that if they, if they need encouragement, you bring encouragement today. And we're just going to um, place this service in your hands today, and we're just going to uh, ask you just to take over and just be in complete control today. And we just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. Page 135. Lord, Lord we praise you. it again. keep on going how great thou art that's on page 33 so back all the way up uh, to page 33 how great thou art
believes that this morning? Amen. 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 All right. Make sure y'all still alive out there. All right. We're going to try Our God Reigns. Um, 268 in your hymnals. Page 268. Our God Reigns. Y'all going to have to sing with us. Y'all can have a seat if you'd like. We're going to take up our offering now, so if I can get some ushers to come and uh, our kids to come, they're going to sing for us this morning, and uh, we're just going to get right into it here. Here comes Job. He's ready to go this morning. All right. Brother Eddie, you care to bless our offering for us this morning?
words were disciples. Jesus forever. Simon, Peter, Peter Andrew. James, his brother, John. Philip, Thomas, Matthew. James, his son of Matthew. Matthew, Simon, Judas, and Bartholomew. He has called us to. He has called us to. anniversaries we got Dee and Stella had their big anniversary Christmas Eve wasn't it you want to yell out how many how many years Sixty. <laughs> he like never got that out Anniversary to you every day of the year. May you feel Jesus near. Happy anniversary to you. Happy anniversary to you. And the best year you've ever Oh, 
power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in this life given flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder working power in the blood of the land. There is power, power, wonder working power in the precious blood of the land. Would you do service for Jesus, your King? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Wherever you live daily, the praise is to sing. There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Precious blood of the Sometimes I think about the life you live and the cross you bore walking up that hill and I wonder why you love someone like me so unworthy so full
your time, Brother Buford. <laughs> all right, all right. Well, it looks like everybody survived Christmas. Barely. <laughs> all right, all the kids, Sister Ron is going to take them back to Children's Church if any of y'all want to go. And the rest of us, we're going to be in, in Romans, in the Daniel chapter 3. And we're going to look at, um, I'm going to read to you verses 15 through 18, but we're going to go through Jan Daniel chapter 3, and then tonight we're going to look at Daniel chapter 6. Um, when um, I was getting the sermon together, and it, it started out as one sermon, but when you end up with 11, 12, 13 pages of notes, it, it, it tends to turn into two real, pretty quickly, unless you all want to stay till 2 or 3 o'clock, but... Um, but we're going to try to divide it up. So this morning we're going to look at Daniel chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 15 through 18. And, and I was looking back, and we know this is our last Sunday of 2014, don't we? Where did time go, right? It, was, it seems like yesterday we were, we were standing up here saying, well, it's the last Sunday of 2013, and, and it just goes by faster and faster and faster. And I look back to see what... Uh, the sermon was that, that I preached the last Sunday of 2013, and it was out of 1 Corinthians chapter 5, and the title was Out with the Old and In with the New. And, and I looked at it a little bit, and what we focused on really was how we looked back and we reflected on the things, the past and the old things, but we didn't kind of dwell there, and we, but instead we looked forward to the future. We looked to those things, and we let those things not really dictate what we did, but we learned from those things, and we looked towards the future. And we're going to kind of look back into the past just a little little bit, but we're going to look at it in kind of a different perspective this morning, and we're really um, going to be uh, focusing on, on the subject of praising God anyway. Say that with me. Praise God anyway. One more time. Praise God anyway. That's what I want us to really remember for this morning and tonight, that regardless of what goes on, what happens in our lives, what our circumstances are, that we're going to need to praise God anyway. If, we're going to, if we think that we're going to make it through this life unscathed, we, we're, we, we've got those rose-colored glasses on, we might as well take them off. Because things are going to happen. There's going to be good things, there's going to be bad things, there's going to be good times, there's going to be bad times. And, and we're going to have to learn, if we're going to make it and we're going to survive, that we're going to have to praise God anyway. And we're going to have to praise God even through these things, okay? Casting Crowns um, has a song that says, Praise You in the Storm. And really, it's not really much praising in the storm, but all the way through the storm. And we, we always talk about, too, how uh, people need to come to Christ and they need to come to the cross, but they also need to go through the cross and they need to go through Christ and they need to be carrying Christ with them throughout their entire lives. And it's being able to praise God regardless of what happens. And that's kind of what we're going to look at. And we're going to borrow from our Wednesday night studies a little bit because really there's no better examples than when you find in the book of Daniel and actually, the book of Daniel and the book of Job are probably two of the best examples of praising God regardless of our situations. And, um, and, and like I said, this morning we're looking at Daniel chapter 3, and we're going to be looking at the Hebrew children, or they call them children, but really they were in their 20s by this time. And we're going to be looking at that this morning and the um, fiery furnace. And then tonight we're going to be looking at Daniel and the lion's den. And, um, and, and so if you've been coming on Wednesday nights, you've already got kind of a head start. But if not, we're going to kind of catch some of the history here. And and, uh, but we're not going to be able to cover absolutely every single verse in depth, so I would encourage you to take it home and read it. They're not very long chapters. Read them and study them a little bit. Uh, you may learn something. So stand with me. When you find Daniel chapter 3, um, stand with me there, and let me find it in my little notes here. Daniel chapter 3, verse 15 is where I'm going to pick up. It says, Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. But if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace. Then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand? And I love this part. It says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it. It says, and if he will rescue us from your hand, O king, and he will rescue us from your hand. It says, but even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Read that last verse again. We will not... Serve your gods or worship the image of gold that you have set up. Not going to do it. 
Pray with me. Father, we come and we just thank you. And I just thank you so much for our singing this morning, Father, our time of song and worship. And just thank you for the sweet presence of the Holy Spirit among us today, Father. And I just ask you to uh, continue to be with us, Father. Continue to help us to understand your word, Father. Help me to uh, deliver this message, Father. Help me to uh, be able to, uh, to get the words out, Father, and to do it in a way that's understandable. And help us to respond to this message today, Father. I don't care about hearing the word as much as I care about us being able able to do the word, be able to fulfill the word, and being able to do the things that you want us to do, to be able to praise you regardless of what we face and how good it is or how bad it is, Father. And I just ask you to help us this morning to see that and to see the need for that and to strengthen our desire for you and to strengthen our resolve, Father, for you this morning. And just help us to seek you with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, Father, and to love you with all that we are. We just thank you again this morning in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all for standing it. So this morning we're going to talk just a little bit about praising God through the fire. We're going to look at the history here and what's going on here. And, and what I read there was kind of the middle of this account there of, um, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and the, and the fiery furnace. And, and, and you know, if you grew up in church, I'm sure you heard this story in Sunday school and you heard about the three little Hebrew children and all this and all that. And, and, and like I said just a few minutes ago, these, these kids, they were kids in our eyes, but they were really in their 20s. They were, they were adults. They were grown men, um, but they were still kids, uh, and especially as, as, as our kids get older and get closer and closer to their 20s, I see how, how much kids they really were. But, but anyway, uh, what was going on here is the Hebrews were taken into captivity into Babylon, and, and, and these kids were taken in their early teenage years, and what Babylon had done, what Nebuchadnezzar had done, is he had tried to indoctrinate them to the ways of Babylon, the ways of their government, the ways of their gods, and the, all the things that that went on there in Babylon and all the things uh, of the Babylonian um, society. They had, um, they had taught them all the best education and all the best schools there in Babylon. They had lavished gifts on them, had done all these things that, to, try to, to try to mold the minds of these teenagers and, and, to, and to just coming in line with Babylon and really becoming Babylonians is what they were trying to do. And, and, so, but, and there was something different here, though, about these three and about Daniel. Because there were, these weren't the only four Hebrew children that were taken into captivity. But these were the only four that really stood out and really made their mind up and had a resolve that, that they weren't going to fall into the trap, into Babylon. They weren't going to fall into all the indoctrination, all the idolatry, all the sin, all the debauchery, all the evil, all the worldliness, all the fleshliness, all the things that, that Babylon represented. They were going to serve their God. They were going to worship their God. They were going to praise their God regardless. And they weren't, and they weren't going to fall victim to all this. And so, and, and so but this is what all is going on. But here in, ver, in chapter 3 here, we see kind of a different situation. Right before this, um, King Nebuchadnezzar had had a dream. And he had dreamed about this great big statue. And this statue, though, that Nebuchadnezzar dreamed about was made out of different materials, uh, wood, bronze, uh, uh, silver, wood. Uh, I don't know. I probably said wood already. But, and then the head was made out of gold, and that represented the Babylonian Empire. And, and, but what it what represented to, to Nebuchadnezzar, what it was supposed to represent, that his empire was going to be the head or the beginning of it, but his empire was going to fall, and there were going to be greater empires and other empires that come up after him. And, but there had been some time that had passed, and Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar hadn't seen this happen and he started getting the, I guess, getting the big head, if you will. And he started saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm King Nebuchadnezzar. My, my kingdom's going to go on forever and there's never going to be an end to it. He said, and, you know, he's feeling pretty proud. He said, I'm going to build this statue. He said, I'm going to build this statue I saw, but I'm going to build it out of pure gold it, because my kingdom is going to go on forever. And, it, and so he builds this statue and not only does he build this statue, he orders that everybody worship this statue. In verse 1 it says, in chapter 3, King Nebuchadnezzar made an image of gold, and it says it was 90 feet high and 9 feet wide, and he set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Now, you've got to imagine, 90 feet high, that's pretty high, I can't, I can't reach that, but about 9 feet wide, that's probably, I don't know, probably, probably the width of one of these pews, maybe a little wider, it's my best math, but... Uh, but nine feet wide and 90 feet tall. So he builds this thing. 
and he sets it up in the valley. In verse 3 it says, then the, then, the her, then the herald loudly proclaimed, this is what you are commanded to do, O people, and nations, of men, every language. As soon as you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, you must fall down and worship the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And if you don't, Whoever does not fall down and worship will immediately be thrown into a blazing furnace. So, so we got the whole scene set up now. We've got the image set up. We've got Nebuchadnezzar and, and, and his people saying, all right, you're going to have to fall down, you're going to have to worship this thing, and you're going to have to, and if you don't, I'm going to throw you into the fiery furnace. I'm going to throw you into this furnace, and, and, and you're going to die in it. So what's the people's response? Okay. Okay, well, we'll do it. Yeah, the old king never, oh, yeah. We're going to do it. Verse 7 says, Therefore, as soon as they heard the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the harp, all kinds of music, look at this, it says, All the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the image of gold that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. All the peoples... Nations and men of every language. Everybody under the power of Babylon. And keep note of that. It says all the peoples, the nations, and men of every language that they controlled. That's a lot of people. They fell down and they worshiped this thing. And they, you know, in their mind is, oh, we better do what he says. He's going to kill us. And Nebuchadnezzar was a man of his word. If he said he's going to kill you, he's going to kill you. So, so some of them, yeah, well, okay, he's going to kill us, we better do it. Or, and, but the rest of them, they're just like, okay, yeah, no big deal. We don't see the big deal in it. it ain't no, so what? Who cares? So they fell down and they worshiped this thing. But they did it under the, uh, under kind of the, I guess, false pretense that they didn't have a choice in the matter. But I'm going to tell you something. We've always got a choice. Regardless of how, how little of a choice it seems like we've got, we always have a choice of what we're going to do. Always. Remember I read to you about all the peoples, the men, the languages, and all those things? How many people do you think that was? Millions. Now, Nebuchadnezzar, he was uh, the dictator, the king. He had an army that would do what he told them. How many soldiers were there? A couple hundred thousand probably. Now the people outnumbered the soldiers. If it was something they really had a problem with, what prevented them from rising up against Nebuchadnezzar and his army? A few years later, the Persians didn't have any problem marching in and, and destroying the, and taking over the kingdom. The great Babylonian Empire wasn't as great as what people thought it was. But see, the thing, when you're taken into captivity, it only works as, in a couple of ways. You, know, you may be taken by a military force and taken by force into captivity, but you're only held in captivity if you choose to be held in captivity. It becomes what they call, I think uh, in our little thing, they call it a friendly captivity. And that's what it becomes. It becomes a friendly captivity because what you do is, is, you, is you become used to that. You become used to how it is. You become used to the indoctrination. It becomes comfortable. It becomes what you know. It becomes just everyday life. And why, you know, why buck against the system? Why do anything any differently? And see, we're not talking about Babylon anymore. We're talking about Satan now, how Satan holds us captive. You see, Satan can, he may take you captive by surprise and things and you, and you not know where it came from or how it came about, but he can only hold you captive if you allow him to hold you captive. He can only keep you captive as long as you allow that and as long as you remain in that captivity. When you make a choice that you're going to walk away from the captivity of Satan, then you have, then you have the freedom to do that. You can get up and you can walk away from that. Because really, all it is is a smoke screen and lies. 
Because he knows that he has no power. But what he'll do is he'll use all the hard things in life, all the tragedies, all the bad things that we endure, all the things that we have to go through to make us feel like that we're, we're hopeless, to make us feel like we don't have a choice, to make us feel like that, that life ain't no good, that God's not no good, that God doesn't care about us, that we're out here on our own. He'll convince us of those things and we'll just give up. We'll just go home. Say, I quit. Or we'll just say, I got better things to do than serve God. I got better things to do than to worship God. I got better things. I can take care of this on my own. It's a smoke screen. Because it's a lie. Because what we do is we begin to get to that point and we stop praising God anyway. We give up on God. See, things are going to happen in our lives. We can't avoid that. It's going to happen. I don't have any answers for why it happens. I don't have any easy answers for how to get through it. But we have to have a resolve that we're going to praise God anyway and we're going to trust God because it's in those times that what we truly believe about God and how much we truly trust God comes, in, comes out it was the same thing for these Hebrews I'm going to read some more here Verse 12, it says, um, they, they go and they have all this and the people are worshiping the image and everything and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego say, we ain't doing it. And then our tattletales come and they go to Nebuchadnezzar in verse 12, it says, but there are some Jews who you have set over the affairs of the prophets of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who pay no attention to you, O king. They neither serve your gods nor worship the image of gold you have set up. They have chose that they're going to praise God anyway. They have chose that they're going to serve their God anyway. Regardless of what Nebuchadnezzar says, regardless of what the circumstances are, they're going to stay true to their God. And then in verse 13 it says, Furious with rage. Oh, Nebuchadnezzar mad now. He's like a... I don't know, like a spoiled kid. He's mad. He said, furious with rage, Nebuchadnezzar summons Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and says, so these men were brought before the king and Nebuchadnezzar said to them, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods and worship the image of gold I have set up? And he doesn't even give them time to answer that question. He goes right into verse 15. Now when you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the zither, the lyre, the harp, the pipes, and all kinds of music, if you are ready to fall down and worship the image I made, very good. If you're willing to do what I tell you to do, very good. He says, but if you do not worship it, you will be thrown immediately into a blazing furnace, then what God will be able to rescue you from my hand. See how, how conceited he is? What God will be able to rescue you from my hand? How powerful am I? I'm going to throw you in this furnace. Now, it don't get much worse than that, does it? I mean, just honestly... For us personally, it wouldn't get much worse than that. You either do it or I'm going to kill you. Knowing that this, that this guy means every word he says and that he would kill them. It doesn't get much worse. And ain't a single one of us sitting here can, can say how we would respond to that unless we were in that situation. We all want to say, oh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't give in. We don't know that. <laughs> I'm getting tired of this thing. I don't know what I don't know if one of these are on. Both of these are off. But it's driving me crazy. I done lost my train of thought. Thank you, thank, thank you, technology. But anyway, we wouldn't know how we would respond. We really wouldn't, unless we were put in that situation. And the point I'm trying to make with that is we have no right to judge somebody else that makes the wrong decision either. Instead of, instead of judging them, instead of pointing our fingers at them, instead of looking at them and saying, oh, you just messed up, oh, why'd you do that, all oh, this and all oh, that, you, won't you stick your hand down there and grab them and snatch them up out of that fire of hell and help them? 
Be their brother. Love them like Christ commanded you to love them and help them. Instead of looking down on them. That's what we're called to do. We're not called to pass judgment on a bunch of people because they make the wrong choice, because they backslide, or because they fall down, or because they, they have given up, because they have failed to praise God anyway, because the, the storm got too great, and they found themselves out there alone. We're called to help them, to lift them up, to encourage them, to help them find their way back to Jesus. That's what we're called to do. Anyway, we know what happens. They get thrown into the furnace, don't they? And this is, we read it, but here's our answer to him. Verse 16, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. You're just a man. You're not God. Satan, you're not God. We don't have to defend ourselves against you. Who do you think you are? Face it. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to save us from it and will rescue us from your hand, O king. But even if he does not, we want you to know, O king, that, you, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. In other words, it don't make a bit of difference to us what happens. We have faith in our God that he will deliver us. And if he don't, we're still not going to serve your gods. Because our God is greater. Our God is more powerful. And even if we're not delivered, we will be delivered. If our life ain't miraculously saved or some big miracle in the eyes of man happens, we'll still be delivered. So we're not going to do it. So... Old King Nebuchadnezzar, he's mad at this point. Oh, he's mad. He orders them to heat the fire ten times hotter than normal. Picks his strongest soldiers, binds them, hands and feet, takes them, throws them in the fire. The fire is so hot that his soldiers die, throwing them in the fire. Big deal. So here's what happens. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, O king. He said, Look, I see four men walking around in this fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like, it says here, a son of the gods. It says, and I think King James says, the son of man. It is the son of God. I'm going to tell you something. That fourth man in that fire is the son of God. Any fire that you go through in life, God is not going to see you on the other side of that fire. God is going to go through that fire with you. He is going to be with you in that fire, and He is going to deliver you out of that fire. He's not going to say, okay, there you go. We'll see if you make it on the other side. He is right there with you, and don't forget that. And that's why we can praise God regardless. We can praise God anyway, because He goes through the fire with us. And Nebuchadnezzar, you don't know what to do. He says, uh, it says in verse 26, Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. He says, so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. You notice he didn't ask that fourth man to come out. He was afraid to. Because that fourth man could have struck him dead in an instant. He says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, guys, come on, come on out here. Come here, I've got to talk to you all. It says in the uh, satraps of purple, per the prefects, the governors, and the royal advisors crowned, uh, crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. And you see, the purpose of that was so that God could be glorified in the sight of these unbelievers, these heathens, these sinful people, in the sight of Nebuchadnezzar, and even in the sight of the Hebrews. That's why they were delivered in such a way. I'm going to tell you something. Are we going to be delivered like that every time? No, absolutely not. 
We see it every day. It don't happen, does it? But God can still be glorified. Even in the tragedies of life, God can be glorified. Because what people look at, they don't look at how you handle the good times and the good things. They look at how you go through these times. They look at if you're going to practice what you preach. Because it's real easy to stand up and say, oh, praise God anyway. But you start going through the fires of life. And it's not so easy. And I'm not going to stand up here and pretend like I've got the answers and I know what to tell you and know how to tell you to go through it. Because I am tell you what, I am still trying to learn it myself. Because it is not easy. But we have to have a resolve that we are going to praise God anyway. That's all I can tell you because that's all I know. Stand with me if y'all don't care. I ask you, what is your resolve? Are you resolved this morning to praise God anyway? Are you at a place where you're stuck? You got more questions than you do answers. Rattled, shaken, maybe you're just shaking to your core. That happens. Broken. I don't know. I don't know what it, each person's situation is or circumstance. Maybe you need a relationship with Jesus Christ. You can have that today. I'm going to tell you, though, that's not going to take away all your troubles and hard times in life. That'll give you a way to make it through them. Not only make it in through this life, but into the next life. So if you're looking for Jesus today, you can find him. If you need a renewed resolve, if you need a resolve, if you need encouragement, whatever you need, just bring it to God. He can take care of it a whole lot better than any of the rest of us can. So I just you ought to just be obedient to the Lord this morning. Just pretend that I 
back tonight for part two. Uh, Brother Dennis was preaching this morning in uh, Paris, so uh, we'll pray that he made it out okay. <laughs> now, I'm sure he did fine. He'll be back with us tonight. Also, just uh, a couple of quick announcements while they're on my mind. Wednesday night, we're going to be watching the movie um, Heaven's For Real. We're going to meet at, I think, at 9 o'clock down at the Fellowship Hall. So um, um, we've got plenty of soda pop. Just bring, uh, if you, somebody wants to bring ice, bring ice, and otherwise just bring uh, finger foods and snacks. And uh, we're going to watch that movie and just fellowship and then uh, pray in the new year. And then um, Sunday school retreat's coming up in February. I think it's the 6th and 7th are the dates. If you're interested in going to that, it's down in Cave City. I need to know uh, probably pretty quickly. They've not sent anything out, but, um, but I'm sure they will be. So anything, anybody got anything to say or do? All right, pray with me this morning. Father, we come and we just thank you for this time and I thank you for um, uh, the word, Father, today. And I just ask you to help it to penetrate our hearts, our minds, our souls, Father, and just help us to uh, live every day for you and help us to stand strong, Father. Help us to resolve to praise you and to serve you and to worship you anyway and regardless of whatever situation we come into contact with. I pray that you uh, take each and every one out of here safely today, Father. I pray that you uh, deliver them to their homes, bring them back, Father, and just uh, help them as they go about their everyday lives to be a living witness and a living light, Father, to this dead and dying world, Father. And we just 